Uh, so what we finished off last lecture with was we need to find a path between two intersections and then we also need to give good driving directions. Does everybody hear me now? Okay. So what do you think you should print in these travel directions? It doesn't sound that hard. Um, just tell people how to go from one spot to another. So we, got, we did some really bad ones that are kind of driven by the data structures we're using. If we start printing street segment IDs or even the names of street segments, it's not very good. So what would you, what do you need? Because you'd be surprised that not very many people give really good travel directions. Uh, most will give kind of moderately reasonable ones, but what do you need in order to, to get the directions? Yeah, so, uh, okay, so Grace said left, right when street changes. Let's write that down. You'd be surprised how many people will say, um, okay, go down Young Street. And then it'll say turn on Bloor Street. Doesn't say which way to turn. So yeah, left, right. Tell the person. If you just say turn from this street to that street, you've got a 50-50 chance of getting it right. If you got 20 turns, your odds of actually getting to the destination are, you know, one in about two to the 20. So really bad. Um, yeah, you do not want to, Isidore saying, don't print out, stay on Young Street, stay on Young Street. So the fact that you went through a whole bunch of street segments, you don't want to keep telling the person you're still on Young, you're still on Young. So distance you have to travel. So that's right. So distance or time to travel. Should I do that street segment by street segment? Yeah, I see Sarah saying, do it by street. Okay, so street segment is an is something that you're using to make your graph algorithms work, like this notion of a city block. It doesn't make that much sense to an end user to say over and over again, go, we'll go 100 meters down Young, now go another 150, etc. So do this by street, only tell them to change, you know, give them a new direction when they change streets. Um, if you print out, you, you have a nice helpful helper function you wrote in milestone one, which is get length of street segment, you have another one that is get travel time in a street segment. So those are really helpful. You'll notice that they are double precision. So if you aren't careful, you're gonna print things like this. So go 123.79685210 meters uh, down Young. Ken, what do you think? Uh, how precise are you in your driving? Do you think you can get it down to the micron or do you think you can get down to nanometers? Well, I'd be, I'd be a little bit challenged there, Vaughn, I'd have to say. <laughs> yeah, so I think this is a little too precise. I actually this morning had to take my car into the shop because we had actually run one of our cars into the other car. So it was, uh, not a, it was a single single family collision in our driveway. <laughs> so oh, we managed bad. to have an accident involving both of our cars. Uh, it wasn't very severe, but so we're not very precise, right? We probably are not going to, we'll be happy if we get within a one meter. Um, but most solutions are actually, or many solutions, people will print things like that. Uh, so yeah, you want to format this nicely. Anything, anything else? Uh, so I see travel by time, travel by minutes. Uh, Actually, even this meters might get kind of annoying. So see Isidore saying kilometers. So if, if you're going to go 20 kilometers on the 401, you could say 20,158 meters. Okay, and at least it's not microns or nanometers. Uh, but this still looks a little weird, right? So you could probably format that better. Travel by directions. Yeah, I haven't given any sense of direction here. Okay, so what do you mean by, yeah, so north, east, I see Tasif is saying, you know, north, east, south, west. Common place we'll see this is at the start. At the start of directions, we'll see go up Young, drive down Young Street for two kilometers, then turn right at Bloor Street. Okay, so if you, you're at Young Street and you just start going the wrong direction, you're never going to hit Bloor Street. Uh, so when you are starting, at least, make sure you tell people what direction to go in. Okay. Um, so in your map, well, okay, so Isidore is asking, is north always positive Y in your map, or is the data rotated? It's up to you, right? So we give you latitude and longitude. Normally, people make north go straight up. 
If you decided you wanted to make all your maps upside down uh, because you feel that the South Pole should be at the top of the globe, you could do that. But it's how you just you, how you decide to uh, to to draw this. Uh, I see Ethan saying merging on the highway. So yeah, you could even basically that's actually getting fairly advanced, but that could be cool. So you could give them some information about the road type, you know. So highway, you know, maybe merge. Depending on how you how you coded your milestone too, you might actually already know where the highways are. So you might give some additional information. Um, so you can you can write better or worse travel draw, uh, directions for sure. You to figure out whether you go left or right, you actually have to going to do some computational geometry if you want to do that. You can make this even a little bit better. You could actually say things like sharp left, gentle right, etc. So you can make this a lot easier or a lot harder to follow. Uh, and I, I started putting the citations to Google Maps on so I don't get into plagiarism trouble. Uh, but obviously you can go look at how do uh, some other programs do this. And in addition to giving directions, we also want you to, to draw it. So draw it for us, show us directions, make sure those things together make it very clear how do we get somewhere. Okay, so you should plan this out. Just like all of these milestones, this is partly a, an exercise in how do you develop software, but also an exercise in how you organize a team and plan. So one of the things you want to do is start early. Uh, there's a piece of this, which is the algorithm, which if you can't make an algorithm work at all, it's going to be pretty stressful because you, uh, you can't get large parts of the project working for this milestone. So the way you deal with that is try to start early. Don't leave it till the end. Make a plan to divide up the work. This is milestone one and miles or milestone two and three are usually the ones that are the most work. So, and they're too big to complete. This one is too big to complete with pair or triplet programming. Meaning if you just decide you're gonna code everything uh, together, uh, it's gonna be very time consuming. You really wanna get some parallel development. So how could you separate out the work? So for the, I've told you what the requirements for this milestone are. Look for pieces that you could develop in parallel where you can send them off to different team members. What are some of those pieces? Okay, so I see Trevor saying maybe one person on UI, another on directions, another on search. So that's a good idea. UI and algorithm from Sarah. One person printing, one person algorithm. Yes, these are all good ideas. So a clear division that a bunch of people have pointed out is UI. So you could separate the user interface from the algorithm, and we can actually separate the user interface further. So we could take the input part of the user interface. If you read the uh, handout, you'll see that there are two ways you can input things, click on intersections or type street names and find intersections. So someone can get that input going. That might not be very hard if you have a very simple uh, UI. If you make a easier to use one, it might take some effort. Output, so the UI, that actually does the directions and drawing. Uh, it's also user interface, but it's actually not very coupled to this input. One of these is going into the algorithm, the other is coming out of the algorithm. And the last part, well, and then a question that people often have is, well, how can I write the UI when I don't have the algorithm going yet? Like, I, like this is serialized. I, I can't test my algorithm until I have my input going. Then I have to write the algorithm. Then I can't test my output until I have the algorithm going. So. Now you have no parallel development. Everybody's got to wait for the previous part to be done. You don't want to think that way. You want to think, how can I get more people working in parallel? So to test, clearly the, the UI input you can start on right away. The algorithm, we give you unit tests. So we have test cases that will just hook into your algorithm. So that lets you work on the algorithm right away as well. Sounds like you might have to wait for the algorithm to be done to do the output part, but you don't have to. You could just hard code one path. Milestone three, the header file defines what is the output format of the uh, path that your algorithm has to find. So you can just make one path by hand and hard code it and see if you can make directions and draw it in the UI. And after that path looks good, you could try a second hard coded path. And after that looks pretty good, you probably then can wait for the algorithm to be ready and you hook up to that. The algorithm you want to do in layers. So you can, uh, and yeah, so that's basically what Trevor said, make a standard wise way of exchanging information between these things. And milestone3.h essentially gives that to you. M3.h so that we can unit test your algorithm actually defines what is the input to the algorithm, what's the output of the algorithm. 
And that now gives you parallelism. You can just create fake inputs to your output uh, UI. Okay, the algorithm you want to do in layers. Try to get a basic path search going as fast as you can. Um, and so that doesn't mean you have to write the simplest algorithm. You might decide that a really simple algorithm is going to be so bad it's not worth coding, but try to get something going. It doesn't matter if it's the fastest uh, in terms of CPU time, but it gets legal results pretty quickly. So try to get that going. You can split up the coding and testing. So while some, one person is writing that, another person could be testing it. That's a way you can get more parallelism. Or you can split off some helper functions. If you divide up useful utilities, one person can be writing those while another person writes the overall algorithm. This algorithm is, is the biggest piece. So you, you we can split this into three pieces, two UI pieces and one algorithm piece and get that all going together. But the algorithm is still the long pole. It's the biggest piece. So you want to start on that right away, get something working, and you're likely going to need a couple of people uh, helping on that. It's a bit risky to say the algorithm is going to be done solely by one person. Okay, and let's see. Do we need to output to console? So you don't have to output to console. So this UI output, the simplest version of it would be that you print your travel directions out to standard output, and you... Uh, and you draw the path in the drawing area of the user interface. Um, somewhat more elegant would be you write your drawing directions into the user interface, you know, either a pop-up or maybe just write them on top of the graphics or you write them beside each piece of the path. That's your call how you do it. Uh, if you look at the Milestone 3 handout, and I'll post a rubric in a while, there are some marks for usability. So if you print your directions to the console, it's fine. You meet the basic requirements. Usability won't be as good. If you print your directions on top of your drawing path or in a pop-up or something that the, your TA feels is really well integrated, that's going to be a bit better. Uh, and in this one, there aren't any extra features marks. So this is about make the algorithm fast enough, make it get short paths, uh, meet the basic features, and then there's some marks for usability. So essentially, the extra features are, is, is it highly usable or not? Okay, so that's how you can split this up. Let's move on to the algorithm. Okay, so we want to find a path, you know, from one from some start point to some end point. But how are we going to do that? So the first thing is we have to think of what's what's our uh, data model. We're going to model this as a graph. We're, this is we've been leading you towards this and giving you these intersections and street segments so that we basically have. Uh, processed the OSM or OpenStreetMap data and made a graph for you and you've already been working with that. So we're clearly going to model this as a graph problem. Uh, our nodes are going to be intersections and our edges are going to be street segments. Okay, so we're going to start at a certain node, which is the source, and we're going to go to a certain node, which is the destination. And what you're looking for is a path, which is a sequence of connected nodes from a source to the destination. Okay? All right, so this, for example, would be a path. That would be a legal route. And, uh, and, and we found one path from our source to our destination. And I see a bunch of questions in the, uh, in the chat, so I'll answer those maybe in just a minute. So how do we store this path? So our input is going to be two intersection IDs, the source and the destination, okay? And also a, a travel, a, a turn time penalty. So how much does it going to cost us in seconds to turn? So then what is our output? So one thing that we could do is we could store our output as a vector of nodes. Okay, so each of these nodes is an intersection. It's got an ID. So we could return our answer as a vector of intersections. Um, so what do you think? Does it sound good? Uh, so I see Isidore saying we could also store it as a vector of street segments, and street segments is better. So Isidore, I actually agree with you. I like street segments better. Why do you think street segments is better? Why is intersections not, doesn't seem terrible, a vector of street segments, but it isn't quite as good. Uh, and you're saying two nodes does not tell you the path you could take because there could be multiple, Weihang is saying, there could be multiple sets connecting two nodes. Uh, and you're right. So if I have multiple Let's say I have a couple different 
street segments between these two intersections. So maybe there's a back lane as well as you know a main road between these two intersections. If I just return the intersection IDs in a vector, my solution is a bit vague. It's open to interpretation. There were two ways to go in between these two intersections. Which one did I mean? So it's better, less ambiguous, no matter what your street map looks like, if we don't return the sequence of intersections, we return the sequence of street segments. So if we do that, remember every street segment has an ID. So return those instead in a vector. Um, that is always unique, even if we have back lanes and all sorts of stuff. Uh, let's see. Okay, so I'm going to answer a few of the questions that I saw here. And so one was, how hard are the M3 performance tests? Do you need to multi-thread it and really smart heuristics? Um, there's a sequence of different difficulties. So we'll have, and they're just given names like performance easy, performance medium, performance hard. So the idea is we get some information where we're marking you so you can get parse marks, right? So you might pass the easy and the medium, but the hard is more difficult. To pass the hard, you need a pretty good algorithm, pretty well coded. You do not need to multi-thread it. In fact, it's actually pretty challenging to multi-thread a single path search. So, and we haven't taught you how to multi-thread things yet. We'll teach you later in the course. So you don't have to multi-thread things. Your algorithm doesn't have to be perfect and your code doesn't have to be perfect. Both have to be pretty reasonable. Um, generally, if you use the best algorithms that we're going to teach you, then your coding can be a little bit sloppy. If you use an algorithm that's not quite as good, uh, so Dijkstra's algorithm is kind of the second best algorithm that we're going to teach you, it can pass all the hard tests if it's really well coded. Okay, so um, you either need a really well coded second best algorithm or a somewhat sloppily coded uh kind of best class of algorithms. Uh, let's see. I see a question for Isidore. Could we use the Google Maps API to give us the best path? Actually, you can't. So I know you wouldn't do that anyway because it would defeat the learning objectives. Um, but you'll never pass our unit test because we define what the travel times are and exactly what the graph is. So if you actually go off and use somebody else's API where you don't have much control, it'll return some path, but you don't have the control to actually control um the estimates of travel time and so on so you'll never get the same one so if you want that level of control you got to code your own let's see could you pre-compute every single path uh say this is a nefarious class actually <laughs> so could you pre-compute every single path between any two points on the map and then get an order one algorithm okay so there are n intersections so the number of possible combinations of intersections we could ask you for in a map is order n squared, right? One of n starts, one of n end intersections. So you could pre-compute every single path, but it's order n squared memory storage. Uh, Tokyo has more than, actually, uh, more than a million intersections. So that would be more than a trillion um, different paths for you to store. So there's no possible way you're gonna store that in memory, okay? Uh, so you can't, you, it's not an efficient way to do that. You, you can't store that much. Even if you like tried to store that somewhere in the cloud, you're going to have to try to buy a bunch of stuff from people. And then it's going to be, it's going to be problematic. So if you try that approach, it's not going to work out well. Um, okay. So we have to find this path from source to destination. Uh, is there only one path? Okay, so here's my source. This is an easy question. Here's my source, here's my destination. So is there just one path between these and I need to find it and return it? And hopefully looking at this, you can see there are a lot of paths, okay? So there are many different paths you could return. So we have to tell you, well, which one do we want? Um, are, there are certain basic tests, which you'll get a little bit of marks for, which are you do return any path and we just find it's legal. So you'll pass one set of tests if you just return any legal path. But we have other tests um, that exercise runs, which are called the optimality tests. And those ones are looking for what we consider the best path, or if there are a few that are a tie, you know, one that is close enough. So what do we mean by best? Do we mean the fewest nodes? That might be reasonable. Do we mean the fewest edges? Um, and I see Mark saying, this is not really logical. That's probably not the, the smartest thing to do. Um, 
and yeah, if you think of your end user of this as somebody trying to drive somewhere quickly, they probably don't care how many intersections they go past. Uh, what they care about is how fast they get there. So we want minimum travel time. And we define the uh, travel time function, and I'll show you that in a minute. It, this is a classic algorithm, okay, a classic problem. So this is called the minimum weight path or sometimes just shortest path. It's an important algorithm because it comes up in all sorts of uh, places and it comes up in typically large graphs. So you have to solve it quickly. It also is a building block. So this algorithm is actually used as a building block in a lot of other um, kind of more complicated algorithms solving more complex problems. So yeah, it comes up a lot. I have coded solutions to this in many different contexts. Okay, so what is the definition of travel time? So we're defining it. I already showed you this last week. It's the street segment length divided by the speed limit. So we're living in a pretty idealized world where everybody drives at exactly the speed limit and there's not so much traffic that you can't, uh, plus turn penalties. And to keep things simple this year, we're also making the turn penalty pretty easy. We're saying that if your street ID changes, consider it a turn. You don't have to consider it a turn in your directions. Just consider it a turn from your travel time. So if I'm going down Young Street, so I've got a street segment here, and if I keep going, and it's the same street, it's Young Street, uh, I'll basically assume no penalty. Uh, we assume you hit a green light, you didn't turn. If you change street names, so I'm on Bloor Street West, so I'm in a street segment, and if I check a street ID, I'm on Bloor Street West. If I go on to Young Street, that's different, so I take a per turn penalty. If I go the other way on Young Street, that's different, so I take a penalty. And actually, if I go to Bloor Street East, which has a different street ID, I'm also going to take a penalty. So you can say, well, I didn't turn, so I shouldn't have to. Essentially, consider we're modeling that when you, your street changes names, you probably went through a traffic light. Um, we could make this more complicated. We could say you have to figure out, did you turn enough? Uh, is it a left turn? Is it a right turn? And do different penalties. Um, it just complicates the code some. So we're going to keep it simple this year. And your yeah, as soon as you have a street ID change, consider that you've taken a turn penalty, okay? Let's see. What if it is Bloor Street East to another Bloor Street East with a different ID? Do this based on street ID, okay? So if the street ID changes, because every street segment, remember street segments, there's a street segment info, and that has in it a street ID. So it has a dot street ID. Probably got the exact name wrong. If that street ID changes, so for if this street segment has a different street ID than that street segment, then you consider I went through a light or I had to turn, take the penalty. If the street ID does not change, then you don't take the penalty. Okay. Um, if if it turns out the names were the same, which shouldn't be the case, but let's say that both names were the same. They were both Bloor Street East, but for some reason in our data, we gave them the different IDs. So we said this was Street 30 and we said this was Street 35. Then consider that to be a turn, okay? So the idea is for this to be a pretty simple function. We're not trying to trip you up, okay? Um, let's see, okay. So uh, I told you the shortest path is a, a pretty important algorithm, and clearly you can see it's important in route finding. You want the shortest path. What else can it be used for? So any ideas what else this is used for? It's used in a lot of applications. Packet routing, circuit board routing. Yeah, so you guys are, those are very good. They're actually on my slide. So this is how internet routers work. So the internet, you have a source computer, you have a destination computer that maybe has a web page you want to talk to. And in between, you have all sorts of packet routers that are, are switches. They can connect things together. So this is a graph. The nodes are routers and the links between them, like the cabling or the wires, uh, the fiber optics, those are your edges. So you can model this as a graph. And if I want to connect my source to my destination, I want to find a good path through that graph. Okay, so generally you want a shortest path um, or a minimum weight path. So that minimum weight might be uh, the fewest routers. So maybe I want the fewest nodes. Uh, maybe I 
different routers might have different levels of congestion. So I might give the different routers different weights or costs. And then I want to find the shortest path, meaning the least congestion. Those are both reasonable things. Uh, use this also in circuit board design. So what you do in, a, in circuit board CAD problems, okay, so if you design a circuit board, you don't normally actually choose how are all these little bits of metal laid out, right? That'd be really tedious. You define where am I going to put my chips and uh, what the pinout is. So where are all the inputs and outputs of those chips? And then the circuit board uh, computer design tool figures out, okay, this is where I'm going to put all the metal to make that work. Now, how does that circuit board design tool work? It actually makes a graph. So it basically models all of the little spots on the board where it can put metal or not put metal, um, or where it can put vias. Vias are basically bits of metal that go between layers, because this board is not just one layer of metal, it's several. And basically it models every one of the little places where it could put metal as a node. And all of the places where those pieces of metal would connect to each other. So these pieces of metal might be adjacent, so they have edges saying they can connect to each other. I also could put vias, these uh, connections in 3D. So I put edges to represent going to another metal layer. So I, I define a graph that represents where can I put metal, where can I put vias, and then I search for a whole bunch of paths to this graph. Maybe I have to go from a chip up here, so maybe this is my clock input, and maybe there's a chip down here that has uh, it needs to get that clock too. So I need to search for a path that gets me from this point to this point. And I don't need just one path. In a circuit board, I might need to get hundreds or thousands of paths. So you'll actually look for hundreds or thousands of paths, and, uh, and you don't want them to overlap because that would indicate an electrical short. The shortest path algorithm is really useful for this because you'd like your paths to be short so that your circuit board has good signal integrity, your chips can run fast. Um, you need to do more, though. On top of a shortest path algorithm, you now need to layer additional heuristics and algorithms to, to try to make these paths not overlap. Okay, so that's beyond the scope of this course, but it basically shows the shortest path algorithm is used as a building block in the CAD tools that decide how to make all this metal. Uh, yeah, I see it. So PCBs are 3D. PCBs are layers of 2D. They, so they are three-dimensional, but they're more, there's more in the XY dimension than the Z. And depending on how expensive a PCB you buy, so a really cheap PCB might be a couple layers, just metal on one side and the other, and you can put vias in between to connect the uh, two layers. A really expensive, complicated PCB might be 16 layers. So 16 of these sandwiches, uh, and that's going to allow you to have much higher metal density. Okay. Uh, so you kind of choose. Depends how much you're willing to pay. Okay, what about integrated circuits? So integrated circuits are actually very similar to PCBs, but they're much, much more dense. So we model the problem the same way we just did for PCBs. The nodes are little bits of uh, little grid squares of metal, a little spot on the chip where I might put metal. The edges are squares that are beside each other so they can be connected. It's again, uh, many layers. A computer chip doesn't have one layer of metal. Depends on the exact uh, computer chip you're talking about, but the latest computer chips commonly will have about 16 layers of metal. So it's, again, a lot like this PCB. We have a stack of metal layers, and we can put little bits of metal and connect them. We need to find paths to connect all our gates. So the inputs and the outputs of the gates all have to get connected. And now this is actually a lot bigger than the PCB problem. So the graph you wound up, uh, wind up with here is tens of millions or hundreds of millions or even billions of nodes. It's huge. And you have to route millions or tens of millions of paths through it. And they can't overlap because that would again be a, uh, uh, an electrical short. And you want shortest paths because you want this to be fast. So you need fast algorithms. So a key building block in this is really fast, shortest path algorithms, but on top of that, you layer a bunch more algorithms to get deal with the fact that paths can't overlap. So getting rid of congestion, making sure that uh, uh, you achieve what's called time enclosure, meaning that the paths that might limit the speed of your chip uh, get really short paths and so on. Okay, so let me erase all of that. Um, let's see, how large are the Cordis files for the whole chip? Uh, they're big. So when I left Altera, they were you know, multiple gigabytes 
uh, and that's after a whole bunch of data reduction um, where we've re you know, exploited regularity of the data and a bunch of other things in terms of storing it. Um, when you expand them in memory while the CAD tool is running, it'll be, you know, for the latest chips on the order of a couple hundred, 200 gigabytes is the, the size of the data representation of the chip when you're running. When it's on disk, you exploit some regularity and it's maybe gigabytes to tens of gigabytes. Okay. Uh, and yeah, you can't do this by hand. So this is, this is something where you need to make your graph search algorithms really, really fast. Uh, it's also used in uh, in things like social networking. So Facebook actually stores all of your data as one big graph. So it's a huge graph, maybe not as huge as those computer chips, but what they've got in each node is much more complicated, like an entire person's social history. Um, and yeah, they store, all of Facebook is stored in one giant graph. So they can run graph search algorithms on it uh, to do things like, uh, you know, who, who's whose friend, who's the second removed friend, how do we market? People write algorithms to try to find how to make good marketing campaigns and social media and so on. Uh, this graph is big enough and there's enough data that can't store this on one computer. So this is stored distributed across a whole bunch of computers, but it is a single graph. All right, so that's like why short, shortest path is important. Now let's talk about how we're going to attack this. Okay, so the first algorithm we're going to talk about is, is not the best, for the problem we're doing, this is not the best algorithm, but it is the simplest graph search algorithm. And if you understand how it works, you understand um, a lot of the basic data structures and techniques we're using and how we're building on top of them. Okay, so how does depth first search work? It, it's done with recursion. So who remembers binary search trees from 244? Hopefully you remember. Okay, so Isidore said, who doesn't? So maps, who does? Okay, I'm not getting a, a very clear sense from the class, but it, hopefully you remember binary search trees and you used recursion to, to do a lot of things in binary search trees. Um, well, so binary search trees are a special case of a graph. So if we use a recursive algorithm to look for a path from the source to the destination of a graph, it's basically a generalization of some of the algorithms that you use for binary search trees. So let's just write that algorithm and it has a name and it is useful for, for various purposes, but it's not gonna be the best for what we wanna do. It's called depth first search. Okay, so here's my main function. And I'm gonna write kind of sort of C, C++ ish pseudocode, but it's not gonna be perfectly legal C++. So, I'm going to start by just saying, okay, you give me some source ID and I want to get a node, uh, which is my data structure. So I can store some information about any node in my graph. Okay. So I've got a node uh, called source node. And from that source node, I want to go see if I can get to the destination. So you gave me a source ID and a dest ID. I want to go from my source node to this destination ID. And I'm going to do that with an algorithm I call find path. And it's going to return a bool telling me whether or not it found a path between the source and the destination. Okay. Um, so this is kind of my setup function, right? This just set up the recursion and my find path function is going to be my recursive function. Okay. And its signature is it takes a pointer to a node. All right. So each of these circles is a node. I'm going to allocate a vector, um, so that I can store some information in every node. And the recursion is gonna be that I'm at some node, we'll call that cur node, and I know where I'm trying to go. I'm trying to get to a node that has a destination ID, well, an ID that is equal to my destination. Okay, so how does this recursion work? So I, this is kind of the start of the recursion. Right? I'm going to call find path with the source node, and I'm going to tell it I'm looking for the node with a certain ID. So remember, each of these nodes is basically just an element and a vector. I can define a data structure for my node so I can store anything I want in a node. Uh, it's just up to me to decide what I want to store. So obviously, I'm going to store at least an ID because I'm already using an ID. Okay, so what does the recursion look like? Um, first thing in recursion, remember like, back to 244 is you need an exit case. Like when do you stop recursing? 
So I've kind of given you half the exit case here. Uh, I'm, at a, I'm at some node, call it current node. So initially when this is called, that will be the source. I'm going to check my ID. So remember, I've, I've made a data structure, uh, like a struct or a class called node. So I can store anything I want in it. I'm going to say there's an ID. So I'm going to check my current node's ID, and I'm going to see if it's equal to this destination ID. Okay. So I'm at, am I at the place I wanted? Um, what do I do? This is kind of my end condition. So I should return true. Yeah. So if I'm already at the destination ID, if I'm down here, then I should just return true because I found a path. Okay, and maybe I shouldn't have told you, shown you that. Um, so if I am not at the destination node, what should I do? What's the recursion? Okay, so I'm going to start here, starting off at the source. So what do I do at this, at this node? What's my recursion? Check each of the subtrees. Yeah, so what I do is I have all the outgoing edges. So for all the edges that leave this current node, I basically, I wanna go look at this edge. I wanna get the node that's on the other end of it. Okay, so let's call that two node. So this is the two node that I just looked at. Um, and I just wanna recurse on it. So I wanna say, okay, let's, let's check if that node is my destination. So my recursion will now go on to this two node. So I call find path. If, and that is my recursion. Now, if this returns true, then I'm done, right? It means that from here, this recursion is gonna keep searching the subtree. If something finds the destination, then this is gonna return true and once something returns true, so if I found the destination and I return true, I just want to propagate that back all the way up. Okay, so if it's found, I return true. If I get down here, so if I ever get to this line, it means I've gone through all my children. So I went through this one, all the subtree underneath it. Then I went through this one, all the subtree underneath it. And none of them return true. That means I've searched the whole graph and I didn't find it, so I have to say there's no path. I return false. Okay? Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so let me just animate what this means. So I start at the source. That's my first call to this. Uh, and from the source, I'm going to go through my outgoing edges. So I'm going to move on to this node. That's going to be the, the, the second call to find path. Um, that's not the destination, so I'm going to look at its outgoing edges. So I'm going to look at this edge, um, and that'll be my third call. It's not my destination, and it doesn't have any edges. So I just make it all the way down to the bottom of the routine for it, and I'm going to return. Now, when I get back here, I'm still in the middle of this loop, right? So I'm going to basically go on to the next edge, and I'm going to look at it, which is here, and I'm going to look at What's on the other side of it? So um, that's my third node. I've got three nodes that are kind of alive in my recursion. It's not my destination, but it does have a child. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at its children uh, or its outgoing edges, and I'm gonna find the destination. Once I find the destination, this guy returns true, this guy returns true, this guy returns true, the recursion ends. They all just propagate the true back up and find path returns true. Okay, so let's see. And I see, instead of, okay, so let me look at all these questions. There's a bunch of comments in the chat. So instead of that if statement, can you return the result because you return true in the base case? So do I need this if statement? I do actually need this if statement. If I just returned, if I returned false here, okay, so say I didn't find it and I just returned found whether it was true or false. That's not going to work well. The reason that's not going to work well, whoops, I can't animate this off enough, is let's see, I went, um, you know, I, I'm at this, let's say I'm at this node. I'm at this node, I look through my children. I go with this child first, 
So I call find path on this node. It has no children. It has, it's not the destination. So it returns false. If this line here then just returned that false, it would say false and I'd be done. I would only look down one branch basically of the tree. I wouldn't fully search it. So I do need this if statement. I only want to return from this point if I if if actually I've already found the destination underneath in the subtree underneath me. If I haven't, I need to keep looking if I have any more outgoing edges because maybe one of the other subtrees under me has the destination. Okay. So that was one comment. Uh, let's see. And then yeah, I see some people commenting on they're a little worried about this from the point of view of could I get into loops? So yeah, let's go on to that next. This code is dangerous. It would work fine if this was always a tree, um, but it's not safe code for graphs. Okay, so let's look at the, a somewhat more complicated graph. So, and this is maybe a little more realistic for a street map. Street map, we have lots of two-way streets. And so we're gonna, and so we need a lot of edges like this, edge going from, an intersection one way, edge going back the other way. I've shown you the same code that I just showed you, but let's see what it would do on this graph. So I start at my source, I call find path. Um, that's not my destination. So I come down here and I, I start looking at its outgoing edges. So maybe I look at this edge first. So that takes me to this node. That's not my destination. I look at its outgoing edges. Maybe I look at this edge first, it takes me here. That's not my destination. We we'll look at my outgoing edges. Maybe that one. I go there. Um, that's not my destination. I look at my edges. Maybe this is the first edge. So I go there. Um, so I go backwards. I wind up back at this node. And then I look at this edge again. And I can basically just go in circles forever. Okay, so I get an infinite loop. I'm just going around and around and around that edge, then back to that edge. And I keep repeating the same search over and over again. I never finish it by going down here. There is actually a solution, but I never find it. Okay, so I can get an infinite loop. There's what's called a cycle in this graph, um, and uh, which means there's I can go in circles in this graph. That can't happen in a binary search tree, but it can happen in a general graph. So we have to stop it. Okay, so how do we stop this? So I've, I've added a few blank lines. And yeah, Sona is saying, create a vector called visited. Yeah, so we need to have some more storage. We need a visited flag. And this is where, remember, I, this is kind of to keep this code convenient. I made this node data structure. So node is a struct or a class. I can stick anything I want in node. So I can stick some more data in there. And I need more data. Um, so I'm going to create some... In my node data structure, I'm going to go edit my code and I'm going to say, well, now there's a visited member. And I'm going to set visited to be false for every single node in my whole graph before I call this find path. And now I'm going to use it to keep track of where have I been so that I don't wind up going in circles over and over again. Uh, so I just take my existing code and I add a little bit more to it. Whenever I look at some node, so this current node is what was passed in. So maybe it was here. I first check still if it was a destination. If it wasn't the destination, I mark that I have visited this. Okay, so I say visited is true. And then I'm gonna check that down here. When I'm going through the outgoing edges of this node, okay, so I'm gonna go look at, you know, it's not my destination. I have to look at where I can get to following its edges. I, I go see where can I go. So this first edge could take me to this node call that two node, okay? Um, the first thing I do is I check, has it already been visited? If it's already been visited, then I've checked uh, underneath it. I've checked that subtree, I don't wanna look at it again, okay? So if it's been visited, I don't do anything. If it hasn't been visited, then I'm gonna do what I did before. I'm gonna call find path on it to see, well, starting from you, is there some way to get to the destination? Okay, so let's see how that works. All right, so I start there on my source. Uh, this line, so I'm starting at my source. 
is not my destination. I mark it as visited, so I'm coloring it red to show that I've marked it as visited. And now I go through its outgoing edges. So I go through this first edge. I look at the node on the other side. I haven't visited it, so I'll mark it as visited. It's not my destination. Now I'll look at its children or its outgoing edge. It's not visited. Mark it as visited. Still not my destination. Look at its outgoing edges. So I go find that node. It's not visited. Mark it as visited. Now I'm going to take a look. I'm going to look at uh, the outgoing edge of this node. Right, I'm back in this loop. I'm looking at the nodes I can reach. But because it was visited, right, this node is marked as visited, I'm not going to look at it again. Okay, and that's what gets me out of my infinite loop. Instead, I'll go on to the go through this loop again, and I will go to the next outgoing edge, which is here. I'll look at the node on the other side of that, and that actually is my destination. So I found my destination. Okay, so now I found a path. Uh, and I don't get stuck in these infinite loops. Any questions on this? Does it all make sense? So this is a general thing in graphs. Uh, when you're traversing or searching a graph is you often need a visited flag so that you don't wind up going in circles and in loops. Okay, so what's the output of the routine that I've written so far? So we have this find path routine. Uh, we called it with our source. It recurs through the whole graph. Uh, what do we get? What What is our path travel directions going to look like? Somebody's got to write the travel directions. What have you given that person to work with? Yeah, so it's a bool. Okay, so the output of this find path is, is a bool. It says whether or not the path was found. Okay, so it does not tell you what the path is. Uh, so this is the worst directions probably ever, right? If you basically typed in, I want to go from U of T campus uh, to uh, Bedford and Bloor, and it says, yes, a path exists. That is possible. That is not a very good set of directions. So, so we want to do better than this. So how can we fix it? So what do we need to do to actually return the path? Yeah, so we can have a vector of street segments. We could pass that vector around as we're creating this. So there are a bunch of different ways to do it. Um, and I'm going to do it first in a pretty simple way, but not the best way. Um, and I'm going to use a list instead of a vector, but you could use a vector instead. Basically, I'm going to augment my earlier code by adding in, in our recursion, we're not going to just pass the current node, where I am now, and the destination ID, where I'm trying to get to. We're also going to pass a list of edges or list of street segments that represents the current path so far. Okay, so we'll pass it around so that we're gradually building up this path. And so what we need to do is basically we're going to make, you know, when we start the recursion, we'll just pass an empty path. Okay, so the start of the recursion is we're going to pass in the source, uh, the ID of the destination, an empty path. And then we're going to gradually build up the path. So what I can do is every time I go to a new node, I can basically add that uh, the edge that I use to get to that new node into my path. So my path starts out empty. Every time I go one level deeper, my path gets one longer. And I can do that with this code here. So I've uh, created a, a variable called new path, and I just set it equal to whatever was passed into my function. So it starts out as it's the path to get here so far. And when I'm going to, um, basically as I'm going through at a certain node, say here, and I'm looking at the outgoing edges, say this one, I find the node on the other side, call that two node, and check if it's visited. If it hasn't been visited, I basically say, take this, this edge, call that out edge and append it, put it at the end of the path. All right. So, and then I just basically pass that into the recursive function. So let me animate what that looks like. So 
Uh, I'm going to put names on the edges or the street segments. So we're using integers for the intersections and letters for the uh, edges or the street segments. So we start at the source uh, and we initially have an empty path. Then we look at this uh, outgoing edge. So that's about this point where I'm looking at the out edge of this current node. Okay, and the node on the other side hasn't been visited, so we're going to recurse to it, and we're going to pass in, we're going to add this uh, edge, A, into the list of edges we used to get there. Okay, and then we just keep doing this. Okay, so that node, we're going to look at its outgoing edges, this B1, and we're going to put that outgoing edge, its ID, B, into uh, this path vector or path list, and then we're going to recurse. And we're going to keep doing that. So our path keeps getting bigger and bigger. And at the very end, when we find our destination, we have our complete path. So not only can we return true, we could also return the path. Okay. All right. And I think we'll leave it at that. Um, you can think about what's missing. I guess basically what's missing is I still haven't actually returned the path. Okay. I'm still only returning true. So I need to... When I get to the destination, make sure I save the path somehow. I actually know the path that I used to get here. I know I found it. I have uh, the path passed into me. So don't just return true. You should actually save this path somehow. And there are a few different ways to do that. Okay. Um, so that's our first path search algorithm. We'll look at like some problems with this one and then move on to faster and better path search algorithms uh, next week.